Welcome, everybody. Ooh, this is loud. You can hear me, yes. Welcome, everybody. My name is Maria Nicanor. I'm the director here at Cooper Hewitt, and I wanted to give you the briefest of hellos and welcomes for those of you who are new to Cooper Hewitt. Welcome back to those of you who know us. You are in for a treat tonight, if I may say so. You are going to hear from um, three brilliant minds. Um, and it's uh, one of our programs, of course, in conjunction with the exhibition that we have upstairs in Atlas of S. Devlin, which I hope you have all had a chance to see one time or two or three or four. And um, I just wanted to offer a, a very, very brief commentary on like how the programs along this exhibition came along thanks to S's idea and Andrea's idea of coming up with a series of conversations that spoke about creativity around the exhibition. So tonight is one of those programs. And if you've been inside of the exhibition upset, upstairs, and I said inside because it feels like you go in, inside of S's head, I think, and into her soul and into her process when you walk inside um, of, of that show. And I think what we're gonna do tonight is a little bit of a version of that. We're gonna get even deeper into S's minds, facilitated by uh, Dario Calmez, who's here also, so that we can really get to understand the process of creativity and how it works and what it means to how we use imagination in our, in our work and how we go about our daily lives. So I'm gonna leave it with that, and I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague Andrea Lips, who is the curator of the exhibition upstairs, and I know that we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end uh, so that you can be a part of this conversation as well. So thank you and welcome again. Thanks, Maria, um, and I'm gonna use some notes. Good evening, friends. I have been eagerly awaiting um, this program tonight, and I am beyond thrilled to welcome all of you. We, of course, gather thanks to an Atlas of Es Devlin, which is the first monographic exhibition dedicated to the brilliant, prolific Es Devlin. As an artist and a stage designer, she has created live performances for 75 seat theaters to 100,000 seat stadia to Olympic ceremonies that have been broadcast to tens of millions. Um, but she also has created and orchestrates place-based art installations and she generates ephemeral experiences that endure, in Eze's words, as bits of starch in our brains. She is masterful at making the monumental feel personal, at shifting the ground beneath us when we are audience to her work, at enhancing our connection to place, to connectivity, collectivity, and to community, just as we commune this evening, stilling our egos, silencing our phones, silence your phones, and sitting quietly in the dark to share an experience. Audiences, as Ez reminds us, are a temporary society. And while we convene this evening, thanks to the exhibition, our conversation tonight is a meeting of two brilliant minds, as Maria had shared. And I am thrilled that we are finally able to bring the two of you together. <laughs> so Dario Calmiz is a creative director. He is a photographer. He was the first black photographer to shoot the cover of Vanity Fair, no less. He is a design theorist. He is a Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And dare, dare I say it, Dario, I do consider you a bit of a philosopher as well. <laughs> he founded uh, the Institute of Black Imagination based here in New York whose portfolio includes not only a forthcoming location at the Oculus downtown, but a podcast that gifts us Dario's conversations with legends and iconoclasts from, as Dario says, the galaxy of black genius. He animates our ideas about design, posturing that design is how we bring our thoughts into space and time. And I couldn't agree more. Design is materialized thought. And so I am eager and honored to bring together these constellations of thought that are Dario and Ez and to hear how you both interrogate design, imagination, transformation, audience, narrative, and so much more. So welcome to you both. We're in for a treat. Oh, 
Okay. I'm going to ask you a question first. Okay, but first. <laughs> but first. It's going to be like this all night, friends. <laughs> but Buckle first, up. <laughs> yeah, first I want to thank um, Maria and Andrea and the Alexas and the uh, Alexandras. There's, there's multiple, by the way. There's multiple Alexandras and Alexanders here. Um, so if you want to work at the Cooper Hewitt, if your name starts with Alex, you're like 90% there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, also to thank all of you for gifting us your date night to sit and hear us <laughs> figure it out together, uh, which is going to be exciting and explore all of the things, all the realms. Some of them might be on their date night. Oh. This might, we Ooh. might be oh. their date night. This might be it. If you, okay, well, if this is a first date, like, <laughs> stick with them because they brought you here. Like, come on. This is definitely better than bowling. Um, which is, could also be a great first date. Um, but before we, get, before we get started, as really, 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 I just want, like, everybody to just Let's like, like let's just take a breath, because I think we. Per personally, I'm so excited, and what I've been so excited about is to really gift gift everyone here language, right? I think language is something that we both really love, and I I just love the way that your mind articulates reality and experience, um, and so for us to enter into that space, I think we just. It's like, just take a breath, you know, just take a collective breath all together. Um, and then we'll hop in and like ask me all the things. And you know, I'm gonna ask you everything. <laughs> so here we go. Just like, just close our eyes. We'll just take a breath in your own time, that's fine. So we were just talking earlier about um, inhabitable language, inhabitable time, and Dario and I had been discussing a book. As some of you may have heard me ever talk before, I'm usually evangelical about what I've just been reading, even if I'm only on page eight. Um, and I have been reading a book. Here, the recommendations start. Get your pens out, because we're going to have a whole flurry of them, um, by Byung Chul Han, called the disappearance of ritual. And in it, um, poor Jason has heard me talk about this last night, so I do, but here it comes again. Um, talks about ritual as making time habitable. And so I wanted to start by asking Dario to introduce the Institute for Black Imagination, because it seems to me that this idea of making an institute of imagination making an Im imagination that you can institute, that you can inhabit, is so parallel to me trying to make an atlas of myself. Um, so I wanted, you know, we're in a room where my exhibition is upstairs, but I want you to conjure so that we are present in the Institute and how it works and what it is, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's a, a bit about starting at the beginning and then double tapping on the actual words, you know, the Institute of Black Imagination and like what is imagination and black imagination. Um, so the whole project started with me inheriting 2000 books from an artist, Jeffrey Holder. Um, and many of you may know who Jeffrey is. For those of you who do not, his, it's Jeffrey with a G, you can Google it. Um, but he was a painter, singer, dancer, sculptor, choreographer, um, actor, he was married to the legendary Carmen de Lavalade, who's still with us, who just turned, I believe, 93, um, who was the second black ballerina to dance at the Metropolitan um, Opera. The first was her cousin, Janet Collins. She is a legend in her own right. Um, took Alvin Ailey to his first dance class in Los Angeles, moved here with him to perform in House of Flowers, founded Alvin Ailey with Alvin Ailey. And that's his wife, that's not Jeffrey. <laughs> um, and Jeffrey, if you've heard of The Wiz, 
that's Jeffrey, um, who's the first black person to win a Tony for Best Director for Costume Design. And um, he just closed an exhibition of his incredible impressionist artwork painting um, at the James Fuentes Gallery in Los Angeles. And, you know, in encountering Jeffrey and his archive, you know, me, this young, curious kid from St. Louis who was like playing piano and singing and dancing and, but was curious about all of these other things, um, had always been looking for a mentor, right? Because we all, it's, it's rare to find someone who exists in the world that way. And I found one in Jeffrey after his passing and, and engaging with his archive. And I saw all of these books and paintings and sculptures and I saw that what he left behind was a blueprint. What he left behind was this roadmap to creativity. And um, I selfishly wanted to just be holed up with the books, um, but decided, okay, well, what are we gonna do with these books? And how do we give others access to this archive? Because sometimes, I think you just need permission to see, right? Like sometimes you need to see how much input it takes to create an output like that. Um, and without any money <laughs> and with you know several grant denials, um, I just wanted to get started. And so I started a podcast and I was like, well, what is black imagination? I, I don't know what black imagination is. Nobody knew what black imagination was. So much so that I got it on GoDaddy for eleven ninety nine. I was gonna ask you how much. Eleven ninety nine, and I did the whole suite. Blackamed.com. Co. Org. City. Space. I was like, throw in the guac. I know it's extra. But actually, <laughs> seriously, that is a disgrace, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't that a bit of a disgrace? Yeah. That you didn't have to fight for that title. I mean, At sorry. all, you know. And so I was like, well, let's figure it out, right? What is this? We can, we can begin with community and just kind of bounce things off of each other. And, and now, I mean, what, we're uh, almost four years, three, four years, May 31st. We launched in May 31st, 2020. Now episode 93, listen to 163 countries, over 200,000 downloads, it's kind of crazy. But we have books, like it started as books. I was like, guys, there's books. Um, and so um, thanks to the generous support of the Mellon Foundation and the commu um, Silicon Community Fund, um, we'll be opening a space downtown um, at the Oculus where you can finally see these books and engage with them. And um, as, as Andrea mentioned, I also exist in the space of design. Um, and so it will be that portal into black imagination, not only from the genesis or what, like what the inputs are, but then also what the outputs. So you get to walk in and see incredible design objects from designers like any Archibong, Samuel Ross, um, Mark Rutan. Because if I say you know Japanese design, there are names and images that come to mind. If I say Scandinavian, Danish design, there are names, Italian, right? Names and images that come to mind. You say black design, and I'm like, hmm. And it's not because um, people aren't interested, it's just because you, we just haven't engaged with it, right? Like we just haven't engaged it, we haven't seen it, we haven't created a desire around it, and I'm really excited about this idea of repopulating this data set to you know, let the experience of what it means um, to inhabit this body not necessarily be one of entertainment or some other type of um, cultural consumption, but what does it look like to then take manifested black thought, invite it into your home, and have breakfast with your kids around it? I think that's a really interesting and new proposition. Um, and so in many ways, we are subverting retail. It will be at the Oculus. It is, you know, it is not lost on me where it is, what historically took place there. And I think to kind of be in, in the bowels of a space and think about imagination and dreaming in the future is, is really important, it's kind of an achemal process. Um, and I'm getting to your question. And then... <laughs> I'm, I'm really enjoying myself. <laughs> and, then, and, then the, the, and then what is black imagination, right? So a couple of, 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 of readings. One, right, it is this very kind of like simple reading uh, or straightforward reading of, um, you know, what does it mean to, you know, what is, what, what, what is the beauty um, and the possibility 
that is created from resistance, right? Um, that's mapped onto a, a type of identity. So that's one reading. Um, and then another is something that is a bit more expansive that we all have access to, which is a way of moving through the world. Um, so, you know, if you look up at the stars, um, we love the stars and we love the shine and, you know, we create constellations and rarely do we think about what it is couched in. How are we even able to see them? It's being held in blackness, right? It's, in, it's about navigating the interstitial space. It's, a, it's an anti-pointillism. I think we've been trained to think about and to only recognize and react to what is and I'm really interested in the idea of creating more space. And we forget, right, that figure and ground is the same. Um, and we forget about the ground and only are focused on the figure. So black imagination is a way of navigating through space. And then I think, you know, a, a tertiary reading would be, what does it mean both individually and collectively? Or maybe not both. It could be either or, depending how much, you know, time you have. Um, to engage with the darkness, to engage with one's shadow, both interior, you know, interiorly, interiorly, interior, in your interior, sure, interior, <laughs> inside. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but then also collectively, right? And I think it's something that is scary, can feel scary, um, but then there's also, what does it mean to develop that level of trust that on the other side of that process is something exquisite? And I think individually and collectively, and I think we can even talk about what's going on in our country, it is the resistance of facing that and a lack of trust in knowing that on the other side is something that is beyond explanation. And this entire process of developing this institute, iterating on it, innovating on it, has been that. It started from a pile of books. Like, it was just a pile of books. And now there's these podcast episodes and an artist in residency program and a fellowship and, you know, all of these things, right? Um, and it was just an encountering that. So there's multiple readings of the Institute of Black Imagination. It's something that we all have access to. The theme there. It's so beautifully put. I can't wait to be in it. But I, I actually think that building down there at the Oculus, to me, I love that building. I know it sort of divides people, but I love the wings of it. You know, to me, it doesn't feel like, you know, it's a space just of consumption. It's got wings, it's gonna take flight. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in thinking about you know, I was thinking about our conversation um, that we had earlier this week, and I'm like, okay, like if we're talking about anything today, like what is that? Um, what are what are those subjects? And we spoke a little bit about ritual, and I think ritual is something that, you know, in a way, is a mark making, um, is a way of making sense of time. Um, you know, I think technology is another concept. There are multiple ways in which one can engage the word technology, um, this kind of like translation of from one thing into another and how that's done. Um, and then even this notion of design. And so, you know, you mentioned the book. I'm going to read from it because I feel that it really sets us up and it's it's really a volley between in many in many ways this conversation is a living archive it was birthed out of us sh literally sharing passages together um and so you know we will share them with you like this is i mean i literally have the books with me um let me take off these gloves i'm just trying to be chic but you know. <laughs> effortlessly but now it's time to be chic. practical Okay, so, The Disappearance of Rituals. And could you pronounce his name again? Byung Chul Han. Byung Chul Han, okay. So, it says, rituals are symbolic acts. They represent 
and pass on the values and orders on which a community is based. They bring forth a community without communication. Today, however, communication without community prevails. See why I had to read it, see? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rituals are constituted by symbolic perception. Symbol, which in Greek is symbolon, originally referred to the sign of recognition between guest friends, to Sarah Hospitalis. One guest friend broke a clay tablet in two, kept one half for himself, and gave the other half to another as a sign of guest friendship. Thus, a symbol serves the purpose of recognition. This recognition is a particular form of repetition. And why I wanted to start with that um, passage is because I think in many ways when we think about language, when we think about symbol, it is that, right? It is a, it's about a shared meaning of something. And what, and what is that? What is the negotiation between the image in my head when I say something and the image in your head when you say something? And then to counter that, I'm going to, hold on, pivot. Yeah, we're s now we're sliding into Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle. And interestingly, what I'm about to read, Guy Debord did not write, but it is the opening, um, which was by Ludwig Feierbach um, from Essence of Christianity. It's he, Ludwig Feierbach, a 19th century philosopher. But now thinking about sign and symbol. And this is just the groundwork, so then we can like fly off into the stratosphere. But certainly for the present age, which prefers the sign to the thing signified. The copy to the original. Fancy to reality. The appearance to the essence. Illusion only is sacred. Truth profane. Nay, sacredness is held to be in hands in proportion as truth decreases and illusion increases, so that the highest degree of illusion comes to be the highest degree of sacredness. So, my darling Eds. <laughs> As we think about your work, your, you know, I don't really like this term career. I like, I, I prefer to say one's curiosity over time because it really manifests in so many different ways. You know, for who, who here's seen the exhibition upstairs? Perfect, all right, dope. <laughs> Just shorthand, right? So what I love is that we open with these sketches, with, with, with your own mark making. Um, and we, we've spoken previously about, you know, and we'll get into technology and, and, and AI, um, but it really was a carbon life form, one yourself, using other carbon-based things to create something on a carbon-based strata, right, or medium. So there was no translation needed, really, right? It was it was one to one. But as you think about that process, and then pulling it from you know two dimensions into three, how how has your childhood shown up? in the work that we witness today. He's gone straight there, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> no flirtation. Straight for the jugular. <laughs> I should have expected no less from the great Dario. What did I expect? I've listened to enough of the podcast. And I should have known. Um, I will answer the question. Yeah. I just wanted to reflect on something you said, um, that you instinctively don't like the word career. And I just wanted to take note, I, 
I, I, it's something I practice all the time. When I don't like a word, I generally go off and do a little bit of my etymology research on it to find out why I don't like it, why I don't like it. Um, so career, carrière, I think it probably just means road. I don't know, we'd have to look it up, but I think it's probably something to do with road. Um, and I think probably the reason why you like curiosity is because it means care. Uh, I think it comes from cura, to curate, to care, to be curious. And I really invite all of us in this room, who I think many of us are practitioners in whatever we do, to interrogate our language. And when we have an instinct that we don't like the width of a word, if it's a smelly little word, then just sniff out why it's stinky. And, you know, like I'll give you an example. I'm going to ask the question about my childhood. I am. <laughs> but in the meantime, just another example that, you know, I got asked to do a talk and, you know, the title had the word brand in it. And I know why I don't like the word brand is because it comes from the German Brent, which means burnt. And it moves, means, you know, the, the name burnt into a slave's skin or into an animal's skin. That's what branding was. Um, and therefore, I don't like it. And therefore, I will speak if I'm invited to speak at a collection of people who work for Gucci or work for Cartier or work for Instagram. I don't mind and say, the word is not good. Let's not use it anymore. Let's, it's no longer of service to us. Um, and I really invite us all to do that in any area. where if you, if you get a slightly bad vibe off a word, there's probably a reason why. Um, about my childhood, um, <laughs> my uh, earliest memory, and it must be a memory, because there's no photos of it and no one else was there. You know, sometimes you think you've got an earliest memory, but it's actually just someone showed you a photo of it, <laughs> is drowning. And I was two. So it must have made an impact, because I do remember it. I could paint you a picture now of it, um, of the quality of the water, it was in the Thames, so it was slightly greyish um, in London. And there was little bits of trash in the water, bubbles. Um, and there was a light, a bit like I'm looking up at this light now. There was a light in a sort of linear way. I don't know why, but it was a line of light. Um, and I don't remember panicking or feeling like I was going to drown or die or anything. I just remember noticing that I was in a medium that was different from air. And that I would be okay. And my dad rescued me pretty quickly. And I think there is a profound privilege in my experience in that I was rescued. And I think I have, in a very privileged way, gone through my life with a sense of there being that safety. And I, the more I go and make my way in the world and learn about everyone else's experience of the world, the more I become aware of my own profound privilege in that and many other ways. And you know, that's something I... Nothing upstairs comes without the profound privilege of my being saved out of the water by someone who was there for me and a million other things. So I think privilege and nearly drowning probably are the two things from my childhood that most inhabit my practice or most um, <coughs> have led to the practice I've been able to have. I mean, there was more privilege to come because um, I didn't have to work. I had a boyfriend, and I lived in his house when I, w when I left school. In fact, I met him when I was 16 years old. And the objects that are upstairs in the first room, which are objects, some of them I made when I was 13 or 14 years old, um, the only reason they're there is because um, when I departed the relationship, I had forgotten about these objects, and I left them in my boyfriend's house. And years later, he sold the house, and he came to my house with two big black trash bags, garbage bags. And he said, I thought you might want this stuff. And that's everything that's upstairs. <laughs> so your story about the objects and the books and the archive that is now rooting your practice of building the Institute, um, those objects, which actually I didn't realize, I was so... Um, uh, yeah, I didn't realize how much those objects would root me in place. Even just now, actually, I went back upstairs. I've not seen the exhibition since, when was I last here? It was the, the opening, right? Yeah, this is the first time I've been back. No, we did a talk. 
we did a talk, but I didn't go back up. And I realized that just touching base with those bits of paper that I touched when I was 14 was very, very emotional. And, and I said something actually to you a bit earlier about when I come back to New York, I feel like I'm walking over the bones of myself as I walked over each street that I've been in New York before at different ages in my life. So I must have first come here in my 20s. And even today, I walked past the apartment that I first stayed in. And I just felt that pavement contained the bones of my 20-year-old self and my 40-year-old self. And I feel that even in London. And I think <coughs> that placing of ourselves um, in space, it's something that we always did as a species, didn't we, with the song lines, the Aboriginal song lines, the memory palaces of Renaissance thinkers. In fact, there was a thing called the um, Renaissance, uh, the memory theater, and Shakespeare used it. So if you needed to remember the lines for a soliloquy in Hamlet, the way it was done was round the Globe Theater. So where that was an exit sign over there, there would be a portrait of somebody, and then there'd be a sculpture of something. And when you were learning your lines, you would deposit each line with a little mnemonic. So I'm going to say to be or not to be. Well, hopefully he can remember that bit. But <laughs> you know, when it gets more dingy into the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern bit or something, you deposit a little mnemonic, which will help you associate that line. And therefore, the movement of your body in space when you're doing the staging of the piece is associated with, with where you've planted the language in the architecture of the building. Um, so I hope that's some kind of answer. <laughs> well, we're going to have to unpack that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but as you, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious about why, why you choose the word bones, like the bones of myself. Because I think underneath that, or at least how I interpret that, is you know there there are associations with something that is finished, something that is dead, something that is whatever. I'm walking over the bones, right? There's like a graveyard, and even as you mentioned it earlier when we were chatting, I we didn't get a chance. I didn't get a chance to ask you, but I was like, why is wh why is it not resonance, or is that a part? Right, like because essentially you're still in that body. I mean, technically not because your cells, you know, overturned every seven years. You know, well, actually, except your heart. Your heart, every forty, those cells are every forty years. Um, but so there's different cycles that are happening within us all over. So I guess technically you're not exactly the same person, but <laughs> <laughs> but there is a resonance there that's inhabited, right? The body does keep the score. And so I'm really, you know, I'd be really more curious about what, what you feel as you walk. Something that maybe feels familiar or does it feel like a graveyard? I, I think it's, as you say, a resonance, isn't it? Mm. And I think, um, I don't know if any of you do this, but every time I have a phone conversation, um, I remember the conversation based on what I was looking at while I had the phone in my hand. And there's some really important, pivotal conversations I've had with people, especially back in the day before we had a mobile phone, um, where the apartment I used to stay in, the phone was in a really boring bit of the house. So it was a phone and the sort of the corner of a bed, the corner of a door. It was a really boring thing to look at. But I have profoundly pasted that boring little corner with these conversations. And when I summon the conversation, you know, conversations, for example, that change the course of where I was gonna be for the next 10 years or something, are locked into this bit of peeling. I think it was this paint I chose that was called panache. It was a really bad choice. <laughs> it was sort of gloss paint, uh, a really bad turquoise gloss paint color. And I thought it was great at the time. <laughs> um, and I painted the whole, it was actually this poor boyfriend. We'll call, give him his name, Clive. I painted, um, <laughs> I painted his door with a panache gloss paint. And I think he was too nice to say how terrible it was. <laughs> but, but, but embedded in the layers of that paint are the memories of those conversations. Um, and that room only now dwells in my imagination. 
And I don't know if any of you have this, but when you see a house that you used to live in and it comes up for sale and you go and you look at it, at the particulars of it, that happened to me recently. The house that I, when I was younger, you ask about my childhood, one of the things I did was I thought, like I think many of us do as teenagers, that my room was a sort of extension of my body. I thought it was an extension of me, right? I think many teenagers do that. We put our posters on the wall and our room becomes, you know, coming back to your institute, you know, our, our room becomes the rehearsal for making that institute of imagination. Um, and in my case, I had seen an album cover of the great Kate Bush and I was 13 and being 13 and listening to that music was an awakening in me. I think she'd written the music when she was 13. So it was an awakening in her. Kick Inside, I think was, you know, she wrote it very young. Um, and I, I didn't think of any of this consciously, but I think I wanted people to feel when they entered my room, like I felt when I heard that music. And because at the time, our way of receiving art, we lived in the countryside, we wouldn't have gone to many art galleries, if at all, our art was received on record sleeves, on album covers. So we had like the Pink Floyd album cover by Storm Ferguson. That for us was surreal art. We might have gone to the Tate Gallery in London and seen Magritte and Dali and then come back and our version of it was this Pink Floyd album cover or something. So I had seen this album cover by Kate Bush and it was sort of, you might call it quite kitsch now if you saw it, but it was sort of Japanese. So I went to see a Japanese exhibition and my mum bought me the book and she didn't realise that it was actually a book of Japanese erotic art. <laughs> um, it, she, she didn't realise that because I think the title was in Japanese. <laughs> so I was 13, I had this book um, and, you know, I kind of, well, you know, dealt with it and um, I painted this mural around the wall. Um, and so I painted, I remember thinking, I got... I got to a plug, this, this room I had had a plug, like a, you know, for plugging in electricity. And it was in the middle of the wall. I think they used to have a desk there. And I was right in the middle of a head. And I just painted right over it and the plug stuck out the head. <laughs> um, and I guess that was maybe the beginning of my practice in a way. I wonder if you did that. Tell, tell us about your teenage room, Daria. Ha ha, ha ha, ha ha. You know, that's called deflection. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back and then forward and back. That means you are gonna tell us about your room. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit. It wasn't as fascinating. Um, my, my my father was a pastor. Like I was from the Midwest. Like I took the whole thing hook, line, and sinker. It was full of like bumper stickers that said like. Everyday America sacrifices 4,000 babies to the God of convenience. Like, okay, that was like what was in my... Can you take that all out of parentheses and do it again and carry on? Because it was getting really good. <laughs> Please keep going. No, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back. No, I'm going to come back. But as you were speaking, like, I'm listening, right? Because, okay, because I asked about your childhood and how it shows up in the work. And everyone's seen the exhibition, so we can, like, go right into it. And, you know, I'm thinking of this young child who falls into something else that feels constrictive, right? You still feel your, like yourself, but then all of a sudden, like you're in some other type of density, right, which is water. And then you're rescued. What, it, what, it, what, what kind of imprinting does that create on a psyche? especially when you don't have the language to articulate that. And so you're going after, so there's a feeling that you're after. So that's one. And, and that's probably quite foundational. Um, but then you threw in this Japanese erotic art and now I'm like <laughs> looking at, li thinking about like the set design for Parsifal and I'm like, as <laughs> guys, come on. Oh, perfect, right on time. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> It's orifices all the way home. <laughs> <laughs> Alchemy. Um, but, it, and, and I remember when we, when we walked through the exhibition early, early on, I was trying to get it. There was something, I was like, what, what is it about this work? Like, 
you know, when we think about design, when we think about space, when we think about creation, the built environment specifically, you know, you're kind of shaping air, right? You're kind of just like shaping air. And in many times you feel, feel held. Um, it's kind of pushing you through space, um, telling you spaces that are for you and are not for you. But your work was getting at something else. And I didn't have the words for it. And I was walking through the exhibition and I was like, why do I feel this? What is that? Like, I, I feel like it's pulling me towards something. And, and, I was like, and, and I was like, and can design do that? You know, can design pull you outside of yourself? You know, I think, you know, the, uh, you know, the great architects of cathedrals had something um, to, do, to do with that. But when I look at your work, it, it pulled me out of what it meant to be human. Like, it pulled me out of my body. It extended what I thought was possible for myself. And what I was left with was, was the transcendence. I was like, it's transcendent. And, and, and buildings, objects, spaces aren't always like that. They don't operate like that. But your work does. And in many ways, you are imbuing this space with so much reference. I mean, I said I didn't like the word career. She like read me for filth, <laughs> like etymolo etymologically. <laughs> <laughs> because these spa these spaces, these walls that you are creating, it's not just, you know, panache. <laughs> Thank you, darling. But <laughs> but which was kind of a type of panache, right? Um, but you are encoding it with all of this language and meaning, right, like that goes beyond um, tactility. And that's what we feel. We feel like that resonance, but it gets all the way back to the feeling that you needed in that moment in the river was to be lifted up, something that was much lighter than where you found yourself, right? And it's, uh, and, it, and it's big and it's expensive and it keeps lifting you up higher and higher and like higher. It's the exact opposite. And in many ways, it's like kind of fighting that feeling. My dad was also a therapist. Um, <laughs> and I I'm definitely taking you back to the bumper sticker in church in a minute. So Thank you. Uh, we're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my undergrad was in psychology, but no, I'm like, but like, look, I mean, right? That is the opposite of falling in the water. And it's really amazing, because as you were even speaking about your childhood, I, I resonated with so much of it, because in many ways, mine was about safety, too, and being held constantly, and, and, and the privilege of that, of, of you know, this kind of like stability from which to, to leap off of. Um, and I don't take that for granted, either. Um, but OK, hit it, Ez. And then, and then we'll, <coughs> and then we'll Ratchet up uh, well, I'm really interested because I didn't know that about you, um, that your father was a pastor um, and that your, um, you know, your practice was in ritual. And, and just talk to us about that, about going to church. What, how did that manifest? What, what was the practice? Just talk to us about it because it's, yeah, sure. it's, you know, it's found I went to church a lot as well, you know, and I think I learned a lot about um, uh, ritual objects and and meaning being held in objects, and I'd love to know your take on that. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, everything I do is church. All of it is church, the fashion shows, church, like, you know, these images are kind of like icons and iconography, you know, but it's all, it's all church to me. I mean, even that we release our podcast every Sunday. Right. Like, it's church, like, it's like the sermon, it's like what is gonna feed you that week, like, and I just needed to hear that good word. Um, and so in many ways it imbues everything and... How did it work each? Just talk us through the, the day-to-day yeah. day of it. How did it work? Yeah, I mean, Baptist, you know, Midwestern, Saturday night, you know, you start getting your clothes ready for church. Um, Scribe. 
it was different every week, okay. but you know, like my mother would come in and like look at, you know, it taught me everything. It taught me everything I need. I know about fashion, about style. Like, you know, my mother taught me like, you know, how to like have my tie, pick up, pick up like the little speck of green in my suit. Like I'm, I'm only grilling him on this because earlier Dario just dissected every item of clothing that Andrea was wearing. So <laughs> I'm finding the roots of this. Oh yeah. <laughs> in oh the church yeah. Outfit. But we can, and we should bring her up at the end, and I will just. <laughs> Let it's you a very all fine outfit. have it because she's giving it to you know. So, inside, but, but what I'm getting at is the outfit where you could choose it. It wasn't like a this uniform. is a perfect example, okay. right? So, yeah. this this in many ways is watching my mother get ready for church every Sunday. And they these become memory flashes, right? Of like her slip, you know, the shoe, the hat, and then it manifests in fashion, right? Like the bit of play. Like this is Billy Porter, like in you know, um, an Alexander. McQueen gown with the Craig McGreen um, like tunic. And then, you know, and then also there's a, like a level of inventiveness, right? That also happens when you're getting ready for church, right? Like, oh, I don't have this thing, but oh, I'm I'm gonna use this, I don't know, pen. Yes, yeah, exactly, right? So if you saw that thing on his head, oh my God, Kira's here. Hi, Kira. So Kira knows what all this is about. Um, but like that's actually like a blazer that I put on his head and like tied it up into a turban because we needed something at the top. Um, it wasn't your blazer, was it? <laughs> it was not. Um, but you know, for me, so church taught me everything, really. And what's really beautiful and something I wanted to speak about, what we can speak about together, is this. I'm kind of like the older you get, the more you understand your childhood, um, and and the beauty of it, and 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 language, and what I love so much about reinvestigating the church and ritual and the Bible and this word and these words, you really begin to read it in a completely different way. And, you know, language can have multiple meanings at multiple times, but this idea of one history, it imbued me with this long, deep sense of history that, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. But when you when you you're told these stories around you know the Pharisees and the Sadducees and like how they killed Jesus and all this other stuff right which can be allegory or myth or how whatever you want to make it, you realize that like what's happening now and what's always been now the con the kind of constant always now, there's nothing new that's happening, right? It, it, we've had this for a very long time. You know, even in the Bible, right, it says that the, we will always have the poor. The poor will always be among us, right? And so it, it al allows a level of, I think, levity um, to then decide, okay, well, this is not new. Um, it has always been. What do I want to pay attention to now? Where do I want to not be activated? So it, I think it offers up a lot of space. Um, but then also with this kind of kind of church and religion, and particularly for um, black identified individuals in the United States, it also offered a technology of becoming. Because in these four whitewashed walls, you had the ability to become, through fashion and through dress, you know, this rhinestone encrusted head of the women's auxiliary, you know, or, you know, the tailor suited. Um, head of the deacon board, right? Like there was a sense of responsibility and fashion, right? Like the, you know, you go around for offering and it becomes like a runway show, right? There are all of these things that are possible in this world. Even when you walk outside and then the suit comes off and now you're working in the railway station or, you know, the hat comes off and now you're a domestic, right? And so the church in many ways allowed for this place of becoming and being all through this lens of fashion, and it allowed me to understand through my own practice the power of it with a lowercase f, not a capital F. There's fashion with a capital F, there's fashion with a lowercase f. Um, and then it becomes about space. The distance between the skin and the cloth, and then the cloth and the gaze. And in many ways, I call them like identity loops, the ways in which we kind of project, project an interiority through what we wear. And I think a lot about, you know, even, you know, our trans brothers and sisters, right? Even when 
when our interiority does not match our, our body, it's usually fashion that is the first indicator of how we see ourselves in t on the inside, right? And all of this for me comes through this, comes through the church and this experience of growing up in it. And so, you know, and, and then, you know, these other things around, you know, the God of convenience and the babies and all of this stuff, you know, washes away once you get into the world. Oh my God, okay. She just gave us like the 10 minute mark, which is <laughs> awkward and I don't think we've talked about anything. What, does that mean we've done 10 minutes? Or we've only got 10 minutes left. Okay. <laughs> Which one? Um, just on church, my 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 um, um, earliest. I think my memories of church were before I could understand language, because I was just taken there every Sunday, um, and it was in Latin the church I went to. Um, so it was all you know, credo in unum day. It was all sung, and I never really understood it, um, and I didn't mind. I still don't really understand that text now. If you ask me to translate it. But I knew that I had a cue. And my cue, me and my sister, we wore identical outfits. Um, and they were you know, little dresses that matched. And we were the altar girls. And we had to ping a little chime when they said a particular word. I forget which one it was now. It was probably deus or something, but I don't know what it was. But we had to go ping like that. And then when we were waiting backstage, they had all these props. And there was a little mini theater all in gold and it did have a little curtain. When you opened it up, the priest would prepare all the little you know, bits and pieces for the communion that he was gonna do in the middle. But to me, these, these objects had voices and I, I was too young to understand it. You know, I was quite bored. I found it quite boring. I went there to be bored. I thought, oh, I'm gonna be bored. I was bored. <laughs> but actually, I think being bored, I kind of, th I'm quite grateful for the boredom. Because I, you know, I sat there, and I'm, I'm often quite bored in the opera, actually, if I admit it. <laughs> you know, occasionally I'm bored in the theatre. But it, the being Anyone bored... Anyone else want to admit that? <laughs> <laughs> but being, being bored, there's something really fabulous. You settle down, right, I'm going to be bored for a bit. But that sense of objects being protagonists, um, uh, objects having voices, objects being uh, agency, agents of stability for us in time, um, I think I learned from that experience of going to church. And, and it was odd for me because my mother was very anti-church. And she had been brought up in the Baptist church and she kind of, you know, was rebelling against it. So she took us out of a kind of loyalty to my dad, who was a Catholic, and who is a Catholic. And so we went, but my mum would be bitching about it all the way through. Because <laughs> my mum is Welsh and the Catholic church didn't use the great old hymns, it used the kind of more recent, less memorable hymns. And there weren't too many people at the church, so the singing was, let's say, a little thin. And my mum said, oh, this is rubbish, the church I went to, the singing was great Welsh singing. <laughs> so it was the odd thing of going to church, feeling like I was doing the right thing, but my mum also slagging it off. <laughs> and then we would go to these big pagan rituals, because where we grew up, there were huge bonfires, May Day parades, Morris dancers, maypoles, much more ancient pagan ceremonies, which my mum loved. So it was that, look, he's figuring it all out. <laughs> We've only, is the 10 minutes meant to include the question? No, <laughs> it, it can't, it can't. <laughs> per perfect. Thank we got 10, are we meant to start the Q&A now? Oh, okay, five minutes to Okay, to I'm gonna ask you a that. question. <laughs> I'm gonna we have five minutes left. I'm gonna finally ask you a question. <laughs> because Chrissy was like, what do you wanna know? Also, by the way, huge Chrissy. shout out to Chrissy who like even brought us together. She's, she's an artist doula. Um, I mean, I wanted to talk about AI, you know. Oh, yeah, we can do that in five minutes. You know, I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm depending on you all to ask like very practical questions about like her practice and like these things. I'm, I'm just seeding you the question that I wanted to ask her actually. Um, but I will say, I will say or ask, like as, as, you, as you scan the world around you through reading, you know, lots of reading, we share you know, books and passages, imagery, this collecting, 
that's happening, this kind of constant collecting. What is your process of metabolizing what you ingest? And it could be very practical, right? Because there's texts, there's images, um, you know, spaces, right? Experiences, feelings. And it's a constant, I, at least for me, it's a constant ingestion. And what I struggle with is like organization, processing, and reflection. Um, especially in an in ever-increasing you know, world, right, the, uh, the speed of it all. How do you metabolize your experience and your curiosity? Um, I think, actually, Lindsay described it well when she says the process is both associative and forensic. And I'll give you a really concrete example. Um, I was lucky enough to be invited by Bella Freud, who is the daughter of the painter Lucian Freud. And she said, occasionally I am able to go into the archive at the National Portrait Gallery in London and look at my father's sketchbooks. So I went with her, and these sketchbooks hadn't been opened for many years, and a curator, gloved hands, was opening these pages to show the painter's daughter the drawings of herself <coughs> that she can only see on these special days. And it was a great privilege to be there witnessing this. And as the pages turned, they were gray pages, and Lucian Freud had been drawing in white chalk and black charcoal. And these faces were bodying forth, like you know, illuminated light, illumination from this page. And I had this you know, very visceral response to it. Then my next appointment that day happened to be, just because of the way my diary was organized, that I had a, an appointment with the UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And they had been talking to me for about two years um, about making a project that relates, we may have seen coming up, uh, uh, a, a model of St. Paul's Cathedral full, full of animals. Um, they had seen that project in 2022, which was made in honor of um, the 15,000 species of Londoners that aren't human. Uh, drawings of the 250 most endangered London species. And they said, could you make a work to draw attention to the population of Londoners who have come from afar bringing their gifts? And uh, because I went to that meeting, I didn't really have an idea. Just process everyone, notes about how to do it. <laughs> this is my practice. I went in with no idea. I didn't have an idea. I was slightly embarrassed that I didn't have an idea because they'd been talking to me for a while and an idea hadn't come. So I went in. This is the, the piece I'm referencing. There's a, a line from a Nikos Kazantzakis novel who said, she walked along keeping her mind as empty as a terracotta jar. And whenever I go walking, I hold that in my head, um, the emptiness of the jar. And I, d I tend to, rather than sort of cram in preparation for things, I tend to, a bit like you taking the breath at the beginning of this talk, just make some space. So I went into the meeting with this terracotta jar on my head rather than any idea. <laughs> I think they might have been expecting an idea. And we started talking. And because I had that day had the very visceral experience of, make, of seeing the portraits, I said, I know what I want to do. The way that I got to learn and know and make porous between the edge of my hand and the beginning of that moth and that snail and that leaf, I want to make porous between myself and 50 individuals who have come from afar and uh, telling stories uh, of themselves as Londoners and their gifts. And I want to do it in a church. And so actually Jade and Andy, who are sitting over there, who made the music upstairs, who are my fabulous colleagues, Polyphonia, the composers, all the music you heard upstairs uh, was made by them. And they and I are now working on um, a sort of oratorio, taking the stories, co-authoring with 50 refugees in London, a new oratorio work and a painted work or a drawn work. But that's um, how I would, um, uh, yeah, how I would metabolize the, the garnering of reading and of seeing things, I would just wait for the moment where they synthesize. Um, and that, that's just a very concrete example of it. Yeah, I know we're about to ask some questions, but to just kind of like process that, it, um, when, not this image, because that's, that's a photo I did, but um, when I saw the, you know, all of those 
citizens of London, right? You know, all the, the 15,000? There are more, there are 15,000 Londoners of which only yeah. one is human exactly. species, yeah. But that's actually the image that I got when you spoke about going into that, that meeting, right? That within your like interiority, like 15,000 things that could possibly be activated in any given moment. And it's in the meeting of this conversation that those, that makes sense kind of come forth. And it's really your own type of memory palace, right? You know, you're walking really with this. I mean, we all are. Um, but what does it mean to be deliberate about it? And then I heard you say something about a diary. So she at least keeps a diary with her as a part of her process as well, which is also then right, a translation of thought. I usually, I call my, my journal, which is somewhere around here. Um, I think it's in there. It's, I'm like, this is just thought, thought drawing. Like I can't really read it, but it's just thought drawing. So with that said, um, this was a, a bit of a drawing, this whole conversation, right? We began with the dot, and we just let the dot kind of meander on the page. And uh, I wonder what we'll come up with. So let's open it up. Oh, are there any instructions that you want for? <laughs> OK. No instructions, and it looks like we have our first question over here. So. Hi, thank you both. An honor to be here. Um, this is a process question. Uh, you're both visionary. So how does uh, intuition uh, come into your process? Because when you say, I went into the meeting with an empty vessel, or rather you had experienced earlier um, having an empty ves vessel that sounds something else to come in. I, I want to just refer to another book um, called Novocene by James Lovelock. And in it, um, he, he was 102 years old, I think, when he died recently. Um, and, you know, born at a time when the gramophone was all the technology there was, ended up designing objects that went to Mars and to the moon, came up with the Gaia theory of the self-regulating system of the planet. And he said he thinks that all the ideas he's ever come up with, all the inventions he's ever really made, have come from intuition. Um, and he thinks that we as humans got a little ensnared in linear thought because we are ensnared in language. And because language isn't linear, and therefore we fall back on linear thought a, an awful lot. Um, and that we would do well whenever we find ourselves in a condition of having... Um, a process that we feel to not be linear, to pay attention to it. <coughs> um, and I, I found that quite helpful. Um, so I would say, when you, when you make work, when you're actually in the flow state of drawing, which is one of the reasons I want to make this work of 50 drawings, and I enjoyed making those 250 drawings of animals, is the flow state that you get into, any of you who make drawings, when you are observing something in life and then very humbly trying to go from what you see in your eye to making a mark on a piece of paper. It's a flow state. It doesn't go via this um, linear process of trying to make it into language. Um, and actually coming on to AI, when my studio team had a go at using Midjourney, one of them came to me quite distressed actually. And he said, as I'm dyslexic, one of the reasons I find myself in your studio and one of the reasons I found my path in visual language is because I don't do well with words. Words are not stable for me. Words let me down. My ability with words lets me down. And I've always been uh, good with imagery. And he said, and yet with mid-journey, it's take me back to language because I need to prompt it with lo lots and nods of people who use it, right? I need to prompt it with language again. So it's getting us caught back up in that mirror maze of feedback loop of language. Um, so yeah, I think it, the answer to your question broadly is yes, intuition is absolutely central, I think. What would you say? Uh, I would say so for sure. And in many ways, I, I kind of populate, like so I, I, I am also always collecting, right? right? I'm always collecting, I have like a whole research folder of images and things and books and whatever. 
And if I have a project that I'm working on, I just kind of visit it. I just visit it and I start pulling things aside that just resonate. I don't question it, I don't think about it. I'm just like, this is right, this is right, interesting. I don't know why, this is right, this is interesting. I actually curious, this is how I came up with the Vanity Fair cover. I literally, like even the image, you know, with the, and I'm drawing Viola Davis, yes, but the gentleman, Gordon, um, that back was just in my series of images and I just pulled it aside. I did not question it. I, was just, I, I didn't map onto it the histories and the pain and the, I didn't. I was just like, I don't know, yes, yes, yes. And I put it into a folder and then I just look at it. And I, and I, I think it's a matter of trust, right? It's a muscle that you, that you exercise and you know that for whatever reason this is going to make sense because it's going to come out. It's going to, you, you, we, we are all independently operating algorithms. And what you ingest, both physically, mentally, audibly, it's going to come out. It's going to come out in some way. And I think what's really dope about what it means to be embodied consciousness is that you are the locus of that, which means that unlike AI, which is, a, which is full of a, a data set that we can create and populate and shit, is that you actually can shift your data set. You can begin to take in new inputs, make a different choice, make different decisions, and then it opens up something else, which then leads to a different result in your life, in who you attract, in maybe what pops up and what's interesting to you. And so we actually have the ability to shift our own algorithm if we don't like what's being produced at any given moment, which I think is really dope. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is this idea of like desire as a type of intelligence. Um, I think of it as like there's some type of intelligence from like a future version of myself. And it's like, no, there's something amazing, but just follow that cute boy into the shop <laughs> and that's all you gotta worry about. <laughs> You know, and that's how it happens, right? Like you're like, I'm gonna take this dance class because that's where all the cute girls are and you have no idea that within you is this incredible ability. And so, yeah, sometimes it's just the next best step, the path of least resistance. Question for both of you on the role of language. Uh, Cause you both seem so attuned to language um, and to etymology. Um, but also the language is potentially limiting or a trap. Can you say a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a, a, indeed both, isn't it? Um, and I think I've oscillated uh, my whole practice between language and image, um, making marks that are, you know, marks of, of a painting or marks of, uh, of writing. Um, when I was studying, I uh, I was in the art school, at, you know, in the art department of my school at high school, um, and I loved to draw, but I, when it came to making a decision about would I go on and study art, I didn't feel that the people around me at that point, I didn't feel I was quite part of their tribe. They were so ready to um, be embodied in their work, in their paint, in their, and I wasn't, I didn't, I felt like a bit of an imposter in my paint, it wasn't me, it was me trying still on different paint painters. You know, I was still trying, I was still in the shop, trying on the different <laughs> styles, you know, the different skins of paint. Um, and I felt I needed to learn a lot more um, and, and continue on a path of curiosity. So I delved into language for three years, studying English literature at university. But there I felt kind of bereft of making the marks of paint. So I therefore painted my whole apartment, which was a rented apartment, um, <laughs> with, with terrible murals. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a bad habit. Um, and it was this oscillation, oscillation <laughs> between those two ways of being. And, and even now in my studio, it's that. So I will be writing a text, the book that accompanies this exhibition. You know, Andrea and I spent, you know, very many, <laughs> many, many months um, working on the text of it. You know, the text was really important crafting the text. And then the text fed back into the image. Um, so I, all I can say about that really is, we are creatures in language, but actually the book that we were referencing earlier um, really advocates silence um, and the practice of silence. 
and actually what a resistance it can be in our current um, condition, in our current, that the capital hates silence, capital wants communication. Um, so an act of resistance against systems that we would like to change is silence. Um, so I, th I think practicing that, you know, and, and sometimes on my Sunday, my Sunday practice will be to get my pile of books, um, sit on my sofa, and just be quiet. Just, just, and I'm quite conscious that see what would happen if I don't talk all day. You know, I will listen. I will, you know, not be rude to people. I'll, you know, give monosyllabic kind of encouraging answers, but just try and not talk, and see what happens if I just read all day. Um, and you, you, you realize how. Um, unconducive our current society is for silence. Um, so yeah, I think trying to resist language and then diving back into it, and it you know, and, and then just being trying to be incredibly careful with it. And uh, you know, like I said at the beginning, if there's a word that's you know got a whiff about it, don't be scared to call it out. And people are gent when I call out words, people even people who are called like the lady who, who I was slagging off the word brand to, her title was head of brand. Yeah, <laughs> I only realised that afterwards. But she didn't mind, you know. People don't mind; they, they don't take it personally. It's a word. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I will, um, you know, go quickly. One, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be more quiet. I, obviously, I continue to fall off the wagon, but <laughs> I'm really <laughs> trying to practice silence. Um, I'll say two quick things about language. One, it is uh, usually the beginning of my image making, the beginning of creating a fashion show. Right? It, it kind of, it begins to shape the dimensions of what I'm going to create as I, if I write about it, um, usually some type of essay or something like that. So that's a big part of the process. And then um, secondly, you know, through the lens of design, I also include language as, as, as a design. Um, because, you know, as Andrea mentioned, and we geeked out about this, um, but, you know, I define design is the technology to bring thought into space and time, right? It's the series of mechanisms to bring the immaterial into materiality. So everything we're visually witnessing right now was once an idea in somebody's head, and we're living in solid thought. We're living in embodied consciousness. But language is also that as well, because it is also a translation of thought. And I think that we don't think about the ways in which the language we're speaking is shaping our reality, like an extruder, you know, if you have like a Play-Doh thing, you know, that, that thing, um, and you put like a little triangle in front of it, well, then everything that comes out of it is going to be in the shape of a triangle. Well, language operates like that. English operates like that. You know, the syntax of it forces us to separate ourselves from the environment, right? There's always a subject that's acting upon an object and in many ways, it's then how we interpret our reality. I'm Because of the language I'm speaking, I am actually forced to other someone or the wall or to objectify, right? How is language actually shaping the way in which we understand the world, whether or not that's true? And if you speak multiple languages, you understand that that line starts to get blurry sometimes, particularly outside of like the Romance and Germanic languages, there are languages that give pronouns to what we would consider inanimate objects. If we existed in a culture that gave pronouns to rocks and, and rivers and streams, would we be existing in the climate crisis? You know, and so that's how I also think about language. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask how you maintain your authenticity to your creative, like divine creativity while working on commercial projects. We talked about this. Um, that's a great question. Um, and in essence, in, e in essence, I think it's about approaching it from a place of curiosity. I th and, and also like having a having your own practice, right? So like what is that space in which I can just fully be myself? I'm working work, I'm making work for myself. Maybe no one sees it. Um, so there's there's that. I approach what I guess would be quote unquote commercial work as an opportunity to collaborate. 
So there's my voice and the way that I see things. And then there's someone else who has their own needs and like demands. And then together, we create something that neither one of us could have foreseen. So I really see it more as collaborative. Um, and I know there are spaces where, like say like, you know, you studied at you know, some incredible design school and you go work at Netflix and they're like, could you make this logo for us? Like, you know, and you completely lose that. So I understand that those spaces exist, but I would say for me, I really view it as co-creative and, and really exciting. In many ways, a lot of my commercial work um, ends up in, you know, shows up in ways in which I actually hadn't imagined before. But as how about yourself? Well, it's a really good question. Um, and I think it's really pertinent to all of us, right? Um, and I think it starts again for me with, with the choice of words and how you define the terms of engagement. Um, and so I, because I started my practice in theater, in subsidized theater in London, which basically, there w I never, I didn't hear the word client until I started practicing in 1997. I think the first time I heard the word client was in 2016. I never heard that word. Um, because I was working in theater where there wasn't a client. There was an audience. The person who paid me, and I didn't get paid much, I have to say, in the theater, but the person who paid me what they paid me was the, the theater producer. They were a producer, but I wouldn't have called them a client. If anyone was the client, it probably was the audience, but we didn't use that word. Um, so when it first showed up, uh, I was very observant to the tone of it and how it showed up. And it was when I was making a work um, called Mirror Maze in uh, a warehouse in London, um, which was being paid for by Chanel. And they were paying ID Magazine um, to commission. In fact, what they really wanted to commission, I think, was an advert, but I misread the email. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I no, I really did. I, I was so desperate. I, I was very keen to make uh, a sculpture, to make a work of art. Um, and so I literally thought the email said, Dear Es Devlin, would you like to make a work of art? When I read it later, it did actually say, Perfume advert, would you like to find a director and you can design the set or something? But I just didn't read it right. So I really advocate that in all your dealings. Just read what the fuck you want to read into that email. <laughs> That's first thing. <laughs> and, then, and then the next thing was, I, as we got deeper into it, um, I found that when the word client came up, it was in the instances like the, the producer of the project saying, well, the client doesn't want that. Or the client doesn't want to pay for that. It, and it was a, a weird little arsy little word. And I was like, well, I, I, I don't like this word. I'm not having it. So um, then later I realized that um, it was also demeaning to the person paying for the work to call them a client. It meant that the relationship with them was not based on what you just said of collaboration creatively. It was just based on a transaction of money. And they were transacting much more than money. And my experience has been with the people that I work with in the houses of Cartier and Gucci and Instagram, that the people I'm working with and the reason I'm drawn to those houses and is because I like those people. I don't work with people I don't like. And they are good people really trying to do good things. Um, and that's why I'm doing the collaboration. So I will ban the word client along with the word brand <laughs> because they both demean the, 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 the quality of relationship um, and then make good work. You know, and, and, and a concrete example would be the work that you saw with the dome with the animals. The invitation of that work was, will you make an activation to celebrate Londoners for Cartier? An activation. I said, well, I don't like the word activation, and I don't like the word event very much. They both feel temporary and insubstantial, and especially in relation to the amount of money that's going to be put in them. You know, compared to making a theater work, the amount of money that there is for a week-long activation is kind of obscene in a way, right? So if you've got that money, let's make something substantial. Let's make a ritual. Um, so I said, well, I, I, I don't think I'll do an activation celebrating human Londoners, but how about a ritual celebrating more than human Londoners? And can we do it at an art institution rather than, you know, in a wherever? You know, let's do it somewhere where it all 
have the gravitas of, of a work of art. And then suddenly, you know, that becomes, you don't then get into that binary dichotomy between commercial work and work for yourself. It's all continuous, and it, sh it must be, because we've only got one life. So we can't be binary and say, well, I'm doing this one for the money and this one for me. It all has to be for me. And it all has to be for those people who are in the companies that are making the money as well. It has to be for them too. And for anyone who turns up. Right, we're going to do two more. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, I was wondering, as both creatives who are capturing the shared imaginations of audiences, what is the experience like when you are trying to come up with something that is specifically for this kind of shared exchange of thought and experience? Firstly, I think in audiences is the, the audience, even today, the audience are part of the materiality of the work. So in everybody's mind, if you're doing, for example, a pop concert, um, there exists the um, experience of each of the songs that they're going to hear that evening. It already is there. It's already material there, especially at a concert where everybody turns up already knowing the lyrics. They already know. So I think in terms of then curating the shared experience, it's, it's recognizing that you are co-authoring it with the audience. Um, and I think that's the thing to remember throughout and to forget the idea, even in this conversation we have, we're co-authoring it with you. The way you are nodding or not nodding or laughing or you know, our sense of how you feel about us talking is part of what is making us say the things we make. And that's true in every condition of a gathering. And that's why they're so sacred. Um, so that would be my start of an answer. Yeah, thank you for that time. I needed it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's rare that he needs any time. But, <gasps> but it's a very simple um, answer, and actually I, I ask, how, how, how do I want them to feel? How do I want the audience to feel? And sometimes that's a, a journey of feelings, you know, and then you can sculpt that. But that is actually, I leave it like, how do I want the audience to feel? I mean, even walking into this, I was like, how do I want the audience to feel. I wanted this conversation to be a gift of language that you could walk away with and <coughs> kind of think about things in a different way. Like that was the feeling, right? Like, so yeah, how do I want them to feel? But we asked each other how our conversation could be of service, yeah. you know, and that's exactly. always in mind. You always know, of service. Otherwise, what's the point? Exactly. Yeah, and also interested in like how can we say something that hasn't been said before, right? I mean, you've been out here in the world speaking publicly a lot, and how can we offer uh, a new entry point? Into, into your practice and, and work and on career. <laughs> the panache of it. <laughs> you both uh, talked about uh, your relationship to carbon, uh, using uh, drawing as a core way of expressing yourselves. I wanted to understand how you think about silicon. I'd like to know how you think about silicon. <laughs> uh, I, I write about virtual reality technology, and uh, I think it's going to be a big deal, and I wanted to understand how it will affect your work. I mean, one thing I did read, and you'll correct me because you're knowledgeable about silicon more than I am, but in the James Lovelock, he talks about um, the time it takes for a thought to pass along the neuronal synaptic process, and that in um, electronic life forms, you know, when he writes this book, Nova Scene, he's talking about the epoch that will succeed the Anthropocene electronic life forms. And he says that the passage of thought will be 10,000 times quicker. Um, and I believe he's referring to silicon in that answer. Um, and the speed at which communication will happen or even just thought will happen. Um, so I'm quite interested uh, in what you have to say about actually. I don't think either of us are experts on silicon, are you? I wouldn't necessarily say I'm an expert, um, but I don't think one needs to be an expert. Um, I think, I w we actually had this conversation. Um, I think the question is, what will be lost 
because to go from you know being a carbon lifeform using you know some type of carbon based instrument to then write into that right that also is made of the same kind of ground there's nothing lost really right or like the translation is minimal but for me to write in my journal versus me texting it onto my phone there's something that's lost because I have to tra because there's a translation there's a leap from one technology to another and I think really the question is what will be lost and I think we don't think about that um, what what data is removed in the translation I think when we think about photography it's why I love film photography so much because it's and, and I don't like to use film cameras with batteries or anything. I don't want anything to get between me and like the making of the image. And because it's all analog, it's all existing in, in the same <coughs> medium. And then if I use a digital camera, it shifts, right? Something is lost. And, and I think, you know, when we start adding filters and all, the, it's, it, it's a desire to get back to what was lost in the translation and so and we had this conversation about ritual and this idea of like rituals of technology how do we allow ourselves um, a space of ritual when it is constantly stripped away as we continue to translate the lived experience in different ways and you and you are right it is happening it's been happening and it is coming right that that we will it won't be necessarily artificial intelligence but augmented intelligence and I think we could have a larger conversation around but what gets lost in translation. You know who we have to involve is sitting right behind you. Is that Kyle? Do I see you Kyle? Yeah. Can we give Kyle the microphone? Do you mind Kyle? <laughs> so Kyle and I, I'm, shall I talk about it Kyle? Please. So Ky Ky this is the great Kyle MacDonald <laughs> um, who is an extraordinary artist, uh, creative technologist, uh, coder, genius, AI specialist. Um, and all the work, sorry Kyle, is that not appropriate? You can reintroduce yourself if you don't like that version. Um, Kyle's in, in the book, in a conversation, and all the work that I've made since 2016 um, with um, large language models and um, uh, you know, poetry generated by algorithms has been with Kyle, and we are currently, we actually just met two days ago to continue our thought process about it. Um, we are making uh, we're training a corner of an AI on everything that you see upstairs and everything that I've ever drawn or said that we can find. We think it will be like a small Tamagotchi, and we're trying to love it. We met we, When we first started working with the AI, it was back in 2019, it was ChatGPT2, and we were working, I was working on this Meredith Monk opera, uh, Atlas, the models upstairs, and we were sitting at the beautiful Walt Disney Hall in Los Angeles, and the only time I had for this meeting was during a rehearsal. So Kyle came and sat next to me. He was here, I was there, we always remember where we sat. And he said, look, I've got this chat GPT-2 thing, let's see if it works. And I'd just done my TED talk, where is, where am I, Chrissy? And uh, I said, let's just shove in the end of my TED talk, because I was still sort of rehearsing it in my bloody head. And I said, only connect, only connect, and live in fragments no longer. And Kyle chucked it into chat GPT-2, then trained, I think, solely on read it, wasn't it? Pretty and it much. came out and it said, only connect, live in fragments no longer, live in fragments and die in fragments, die in <laughs> fragments, you this, that. And it was so terrifying. <laughs> it was like, and uh, up until that point, our, 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 our poetry generating algorithm had been okay, but let's say a little bit twee, because it was based on 19th century poetry and been a little bit kind of da-da-da-da, -da -da, a bit about dawn. And I had b what I'd said to Carl, I'm worried it's gonna be a bit twee. And afterwards, I said, now I'm not worried it's going to be true. I'm worried it's going to be fucking evil. <laughs> How can we save it? And we sat next to each other in the dark, listening to this amazing, ethereal Meredith Monk music written in the 80s. And we sort of said, we must be parents to this. Oh, we mu mu must give it books to read. And actually, I was saying to Kyle a few days ago that um, at a symposium on AI, a young Chinese artist said, I, I feel like I must love the AI. I want the AI to love me. Um, but... Kyle Silicon, just give it to us. Well, <laughs> actually, you were just reminding me of something you said the other day about uh, our shadow selves, that all of these big companies have a shadow version of ourself already, but it's designed to sell us advertisement, right? Uh, and why don't we take that back for ourselves? Uh, and I feel like that 
that's what you and I've been trying to do recently with your work. And maybe that's one way that we can have a relationship with silicon as a kind of mimic or mirror of ourselves. I mean, that's what a mirror is. It's glass, right? So maybe we can make a new mirror with this computational shadow self. Uh, and that might be a better relationship we can have with it. Instead of something that uh, is just losing, like taking away, something that gains, you know, something that we can uh, have an ongoing kind of sustainable connection to. I think it should be like Peter Pan's shadow. Mm. <laughs> I think it's time to give a big round of applause. Thank you, Ez. Thank you, Dario. So I just want to say a quick thank you. Thank you to all for being here. Thank you, S and Dario, for letting us into your mind and to your teenage bedrooms. Uh, for those of you who are making it onto the second date, some of you might be making it to the second date, some of you might not. Um, <laughs> tomorrow, we are doing a version of this in space, I guess with more silence and maybe less words, with a, a great um, performer, Jaron Heron, who is here with us. Hi, Jaron, say hello. Uh, we'll be doing um, another another program uh, tomorrow, moving through space um, in, in the mansion and thinking about creativity as well. But thank you again so much uh, to you both and for all of you for being here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>